Well, we'll start with uh, the early times at Avro Aircraft. Well, during the war, they produced the uh, Avro Lancaster. Yeah, that was a four-engine uh, bomber, yeah. Uh, they made other aircraft, too, during the war, but the Lancaster was the, uh, the major one. As a matter of fact, the fellow that worked with me at Avro was a mid-upper turret uh, gunner on one of the, the Lancasters. A fellow by the name of Ian Higgins. After the uh, war, the, uh, they needed projects to do, and the, they started on the CF-100 fighter uh, that we used in our Air Force, and also the Belgium Air Force bought them. Then uh, at the same, around, no, I guess maybe a little earlier, they started on the jetliner, the uh, CF-102 or C-102, I guess it was called. And it was a four-engine jetliner. Later on, of course, they, they uh, designed the Arrow. One day, my brother-in-law comes along. I'm getting ready for work. And uh, it was a cold, miserable day. We are working in a unheated basement doing electrical work, panels and conduits and stuff. Miserable work. And uh, he says, I'm going to Avro uh, to apply for a job. He said, why don't you come with me? And I threw off my old work clothes and got dressed and we were, I was gone. <laughs> it turned out I got a job and he didn't. <laughs> That would be uh, 57, 1957, early 57, uh, I think it was January or 57. The first few months I worked there as a, uh, in the electrical department, because that's what I was in the Air Force before I went into Avril. We had designed and installed the wiring on the mock-up of the Arrow, the metal mock-up. And when that job, when all those wires were all bundled together and sent to sub-assembly, the ladies in there made all the harnesses, the electrical harnesses for it, and that job was done. So they gave us, it was what they call an internal layoff, and they offered us other jobs. Anyways, I went to personnel office, and they said, what do you, you know, they showed me a big sheet of all the jobs that were available. Some of them were way beyond my, my scope. And here's this one, right at the bottom of the page was this. I can barely read it. They had crammed it in at the bottom of the page, eh? Flight safety, and I, what's this? And before, he, before he even answered me, he picked up the phone and had Ian Higgins come over and interview me. <clears throat> we talked for about 45 minutes or almost an hour, but Everything but the job. At the end of it, he said, what exactly do you know about flight safety? And I said, not a damn thing. <laughs> he said, good, you're hired. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He said, you know, I interviewed about 12 people, and he said, they're all stringing me a line about what they knew about it. <laughs> he said, I wanted to train somebody right from scratch. So that doesn't work too often, but... Department number 7701. My job consisted of uh, packing uh, and maintaining personnel parachutes for, uh, for the ejection seats. We, uh, we were responsible for the uh, maintenance of the uh, ejection seats for uh, the Arrow and the CF-100. And we looked after and repacked the drag chutes for the Arrow. The CF-100 didn't use drag chutes. All the uh, survival gear, which included life rafts and everything in a survival kit, sleeping bags, rations, uh, you name it, <laughs> it was in that kit for survival. The fellow that I worked with, Ian Higgins, uh, there was only two of us in our job. And he was my immediate boss, and our boss was Don Rogers, who was the uh, 
the longest serving uh, test pilot at Avro. He flew the Lancasters during the war, tested them, and he was still there at the closing of the plant. And uh, he was a great, great guy, great boss. That was it. We were, we were allowed to free reign. It was a great place. Yeah. Later on, uh, I was slated to go into engineering department. Uh, why, I don't know. They were going to train me from the ground up and send me to school, I guess, to <laughs> get that. That's why I say it was a great place to work. During the uh, year that the arrows flew, we had five of them flying all together. The first one flew uh, uh, March 25th, 1958, was the first flight. I was there on the side of the runway and watched the machine take off right in front of me. It let the nose gear come up before and the mains lifted off right in front of us, right where we were standing. Anyways, uh, that lasted for about an hour or so and landed. And it was a very successful flight. The aircraft was a uh, was a uh, well thought of by the pilots that flew it. The first pilot to fly it was uh, Jan Zirkowski. The second was Spud Pataki, and then Peter Cope flew it, and one Air Force pilot flew it by the name of Jack Woodman. And uh, it was. The rest of the test pilots were in line to fly it too, of course. Once it got into production, the, uh, the test flying would have been passed over to the production test pilots. These first pilots were experimental test pilots. We were in the, uh, the van and in contact with telemetry on one flight, and the engineers in the van, we were, we were out there just to collect the parachute at the end of the flight. But the engineers in the van were clapping each other on the back and cheering and everything. And they said that the arrow had gone uh, twice the speed of sound, exceeded Mach 2. When we got back, the company downgraded that to 1.96 Mach number. And I never could figure that out. Telemetry said it went Mach 2. Company derated it to 1.96. That's almost Mach 2, but not Mach 2. I couldn't understand that. And later I determined that probably they wanted to sell the Iroquois engine and had the J-75 engine, well, the J-75 engine did meet RCS standards, uh, but uh, they, de they, they figured the Air Force may say... Uh, it flies fine on the J-75 engines, and we can cut, we can save a lot of money by. But the company didn't want that. They wanted to sell the, our our Canadian engine, the Iroquois, which was about 30 to 40 percent more powerful than the J-75s. As as it was, uh, the company uh, declared that Canada could have the world's altitude and speed record any time it. Did, determined it wanted that record. So they were pretty confident on the uh, flight of the first five aircraft. Never mind the 206 with the bigger engines. 206 had the uh, big engines, the Iroquois engines in it. But, it. but it wasn't ready to fly for a few weeks. The cancellation came earlier than the decision that we thought would come yes or no. It came early, and I think one of the reasons was they didn't want to see 206 fly with the big engines, the Canadian Iroquois engines. Um, although the, uh, the the existing five five uh, arrows flew with the uh, J-75 engine that the Americans produced, uh, we did have a, a couple of minor uh, accidents. The first one was. Uh, The uh, left-hand undercarriage didn't retract properly. It, it extended, but it was cocked out like 
this. When it landed, of course, the one of the uh, undercarriage, which they were at single tandem wheels, one behind the other. And as it landed, of course, it dragged the aircraft off the runway. The pilot thought it was the drag chute in a crosswind pulling him off. So he dropped the drag chute, but in effect, the drag chute was helping to hold it straight. But as it turned out, the aircraft went into the soft shoulder and snapped the gear off uh, and settled down on its belly. And had it been on the other side of the runway, it would have run us over. My uh, co-worker, Ian Higgins, had seen a lot of World War II action. When the van drove across the runway, he looked grabbed the fire extinguisher, which was only a little one, off the van, and ran around the aircraft looking for small fires. Eh? And everybody sort of nervous, laughing at him, and thought that was kind of funny with this little fire extinguisher. And Ian come back and said, yeah, that's true, but all fires start small. Well, that aircraft was back in the air in, uh, I think it was 10 months, something like that. So it wasn't major damage. The, uh, the, later, the later versions of the Arrow, that was very interesting. The, uh, the Mark II, of course, was going to have the uh, Iroquois engines. The Mark III was another extension of what they knew. And the Mark IV was a very interesting machine. It was to have uh, ramjets uh, on pods under the wings that would boost it into fabulous uh, altitudes and uh, it would it would be a, a very very high altitude interceptor in that case. One of the Air Force requirements was that uh, that uh, they wanted the Arrow, their, the new aircraft, to uh, perform a, a 2G turn at 50,000 feet. 2G turn is a 60 degree bank turn, 360 degrees without losing speed or altitude. That was unheard of at the time. The Arrow performed that with the J-75 engines. It didn't need the Iroquois engines to do that. Yeah, it was, it was designed to intercept Russian bombers coming over the pole or wherever, uh, and it was the only interceptor at the time, American, Canadian, or anywhere, British, that was uh, capable of doing that successfully. So <laughs> I asked my friend who was, uh, Tom Samadney, who was a, uh, a voodoo pilot, and I said, Tom, would a voodoo do that? He said, he said, the voodoo won't even get to 50,000 feet, let alone turn, he said. <laughs> he said, CF-100 will go fly higher than a voodoo. <laughs> so well, there you are. That's the, and that's what replaced, by the way, that's what replaced the arrow, the voodoos. We got a second-rate aircraft for, for our efforts. We were told that... Uh, there was going to be a decision on whether they're going to carry on or not. And it, this wasn't supposed to occur until March, sometime in March. February the 20th, noon hour, 1959. <laughs> if you want to be exact, <laughs> that's when the message come over the radio, the intercom, saying uh, that Avro had been shut down. Yeah. There were not uh, any happy people leaving the plant that day. I saw grown men with tears in their eyes walking out the gate that day. Yeah. And I don't think it was, I don't think it was because they lost their job as such. I think, I think it was the pride of building that airplane. It just destroyed them. It, uh, it really affected many, many people because they knew they had a winner. Everybody in that plant knew they had a winner. Yeah, and, it, and to chop it up like that, was, that was a crime. It was a great place to work. It was the most enjoyable place I've ever worked, actually. 
and most interesting. Even though it was canceled, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't change that experience for anything. 